all those four that we talked about, the only one that's commercially available now, and there is controversy around, is peg ketocoplan. That's the GA drug. And there's controversy around it because it, it, it does not have a strong signal for visual benefit. None of the pre-specified endpoints showed visual benefit with treatment through, 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 through one or two years, which is a challenge when you say, okay, we're improving, we're slowing the progression of the disease, we're slowing the anatomic worsening, but patients aren't seeing better. It's sort of a disconnect. And so I'm using this drug, a lot of physicians are, but there's definitely a, a debate about that. And it's a healthy debate. It's a debate that we should be having. And, and um, um, the other thing related to that is sort of a, a, a safety issue, right? If you're not, if you're not improving vision and you're, and you're partially stabilizing anatomy, any safety concern may be, may, may be more significant than a situation where you have an anti-VEGF agent that's improving anatomy and improving vision. There may be more leniency for, for a safety, um, a small safety signal. So there'll be a lot of talk about that, I think. And then more directly related to what you said you, 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 like, you, you do cover are the biosimilars. So I think there will be discussion of how do we integrate biosimilars, right? Is there a cost conscious role for biosimilars? Um, and if so, what does that look like? Um, and, and, and how do we, how do, how do we utilize them in an appropriate uh, way from an efficacy, safety, and stewardship perspective? I, I guess overall, I take the approach of I welcome more tools in the toolbox, right? If if it's going if the if the entrance of new medications, even if they're biosimilars, is going to improve access for patients to vision improving and vision sparing, you know, therapies, then I'm all for it. Like these drugs are expensive. I certainly understand the challenge associated with that. We have a very unique um, uh, uh, situation in our in our in our country, the way these drugs are obtained, the way they're the way they're paid for, um, and and they're and they're a significant cost of the system. So I understand the potential value of biosimilars. Now, when it comes to actually using them in practice, I think there is a a challenge that physicians have because they're so comfortable with the drugs that we've been using for so long. We know the safety, we know the efficacy. And these drugs are, are relatively new. And so I think most physicians are looking for more data before they feel really comfortable with the real world utilization. You know, the way these drugs are approved, the typical pyramid is flipped upside down, right? Where, where a majority of the effort is placed on confirming molecular, you know, identity, confirming stability, confirming behavior in vitro, and a minority of the data is placed on the clinical data. And that's the opposite from the way the, the originator molecules are, are, are approved. And so there's not a tremendous amount of, of clinical data when these drugs get approved. And so that's why real world analyses like will be presented at, at, at the ASRS are important because they, they sort of give us a better insight about really how safe are these molecules when we begin to use them broadly. And as I think as we see if, if their safety is comparable to the originator molecules, I think over time you will see increased utilization, not because they're better, but because potentially some physicians want to save the system money if that's a possibility with these biosimilars and or because there may be um, a certain payers that are, that, that are strongly encouraging or even require their utilization. I, I, would, I would start by saying the ASRS we take a strong position about um, two things related to this. One is we really oppose uh, prior authorizations and we oppose step therapies. So prior authorization is a situation where a patient comes in, they get diagnosed with a blinding disease, they've lost vision, and they're told, I'm sorry, but your insurance does not cover the treatment today. You have to come back on a different day to get therapy, even though you're losing vision and you do it day by day. That's a terrible clinical situation for patients to be put in. Um, and so we are strongly against um, prior authorization um, when they can't be obtained immediately. And then, and then step therapy, more directly what you were asking about, um, there, are certainly are, there certainly are step therapies in place, and we've seen them for a while, and, and, and we're seeing more. Um, um, uh, and the ASRS has a lot of conversations related to those with the payers to make sure the payers understand the data, because these drugs are not 
interchangeable when you're talking about abizumab versus a flibercept versus bevacizumab versus proloxizumab versus bevacizumab. There's so many different drugs out there that it, it's it's important to realize that they do have subtle differences that can be quite meaningful to patients. And then layered on top of that, again, I, I don't think we have enough data to definitively confirm in the real world that a biosimilar ranibizumab is going to behave identically to the originator molecule. We're trying to generate that data. That's important data. And I believe it can be demonstrated, but I don't think it definitively has been in large data sets at this stage. And that's why there's a little bit of concern.